नमस्कार अब्दुल फता जी वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन थैंक यू सो मच फॉर मेकिंग टाइम यू आर मोस्ट वेलकम थैंक यू फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी सो आई वंडर्ड व्हाट वुड बी योर अर्लीएस्ट मेमोरी ऑफ either violence or non violence in i know about your childhood but uh can you maybe just describe what it was like growing up in a refugee camp and how did you discover even the concept of non violence well i guess uh, within palestinian history mostly palestinians were resisting through non violent ways or non armed ways let's say as we call it uh through history palestine has been passing from occupation to occupation uh, and so on a lot of people maintain their integrity their humanity their beauty their culture their identity in the most beautiful creative ways and uh when we talk about this illegal israeli occupation of palestine that started in 1948 Palestinians uh, of course within british mandate and so on some have been able to purchase uh, a gun or something but most of the people were non armed and there was no palestinian army per se and uh, the first palestinian resistance armed struggle movement officially started in 1965 so we waited between 1948 to 1965 so that the international community starts something <laughs> kind of so my first memory with the war officially was in 1967 uh, i was born in aida refugee camp which is one of 59 refugee camps which were established after this tragedy my parents were among the 70% of refugees who were forced out of their villages which were destroyed in 1948 like 534 villages at that time uh so aida is one of the three refugee camps in bethlehem area where lives today about 6200 people two thirds of whom are under 24 years old so it's a very young population on a space of about 0.07 square kilometers surrounded by this illegal wall of expansion and annexation on the east and north with the frequent incursions by the Israeli army and classified as the zone the most exposed to tear gas in the world aida camp started in tents with tents of course for 6 to 7 years then in shelters temporary shelters but in the late 70s early 80s people started build, building on their own in 1967 i was 4 years old and there was a cave behind our a uh, shelter uh, and so most of the population of aida camp hit, were hiding there uh, and looking at the sky uh, full of planes and so on and my first memory with the the first israeli soldier was in 1968 during a curfew on aida refugee camp so this soldier was posted in front of of our home uh, in that sense so that the first confrontation then of course uh, later on demonstrations have been happening and so on uh, israeli soldiers coming in uh, throw ch- children or young people throwing stones and tear gas and bullets and so on so all the way uh, moving around you are somehow exposed to this violence uh, forced on you one way or the other and like most of the people i guess my parents were saying if people think the only way to carry a gun and shoot everybody else and if you think the only way is to kill people then you lose your humanity so that's part of our uh, religion as muslims on one side partly as our culture as well that most of the people have resisted through non armed ways or what you refer to as non-violent way well though i i don't like the terminology of non-violence when it's compared to resistance a legitimate resistance as qualified as uh, violence because violence is a wanton aggression against innocent people mm-hmm. and not self defense in in, mm-hmm. in that sense mm-hmm. and people who are, who are under occupation and under oppression have every legitimate right to resist by all means 
So I don't know if we can qualify their legitimate resistance as violence, even if it is armed or, or, or non-armed. So that's a bit of a difference I have with Gandhi. <laughs> but the essence of it is that most people choose non-armed ways to struggle, to trying to keep their identity, their humanity, their beauty, their culture, and so on. I was not a fan of, uh, of guns or whatever. I never carried a gun in my life. Uh, like almost 99% of Palestinian people who have never carried a gun in their life, but uh, try to give their children and young people possibilities to grow up and be educated. Every parent wanted their children to be doctors, engineers, doctors, engineers, doctors, engineers, not much uh, possibilities in the beginning. But now we have openings where children want to be artists, not to be singers, want to be musicians, uh, actors, uh, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is a bit of a background <laughs> of my yes. childhood and the community. Thank you. I, and I know that you are also a doctor. You're a PhD in biology and I think medical engineering uh, from Nord University, yeah. Paris. So I thought because of your interest in your background in biology, if we could just look at the question of violence uh, in a very scientific way, uh, because as you know, there is a lot of controversy about what is more natural to human beings. Yeah. Uh, uh, now we know that both violence and nonviolence are there in our primitive past. But what is your view on this? Uh, what do you think is more fundamental to our species? I believe that people are good by nature. I believe that people are more uh, opting towards non-violent ways of communication and dealing with each other. I believe that nobody is born with genes of hatred or violence. I believe uh, even as a Muslim, there is a verse that God created us males and females to connect and meet and get married with each other and diversify, celebrate this beauty and diversity that we share. Uh, so this is, uh, I guess, as a scientist, uh, I didn't discover genes of hatred, eye violence uh, and violence in, in that sense. But I understand that people have different reactions and responses to injustice and oppression between somebody who write a, a play or make a film or make a painting or a poem or remain silent or hide or submit or go and explode, explode himself or herself or carry a gun to defend what he believes, believes just and right. So these are the possibilities. I don't think that people tend to wear non, uh, towards uh, weapons because they love it just to kill everybody. I mean, it, it, these are things that are taught and not uh, people are born with. So that's why it's giving these possibilities of non-armed ways or non-violent ways for beautiful, creative, positive uh, self-expression that give that these possibilities that as human beings, we share a lot of things that should bring us closer to each other and that we have differences that should enrich us and not make us afraid of from each other. Mm -hmm. That when we talk about justice, freedom, peace, equality, love, these are values that we share as human beings, whether we are Muslim or Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or Hindu or atheist or whatever we are, we have no compromises to make on these values. This is the sense of our humanity and hopefully a heritage we can be proud to leave to our children and the generations to come. And I guess uh, uh, referring to um, Mahatma Gandhi, he said if people choose nonviolence because they are cowards, it's not about being coward. Uh, they should better carry a gun in, in that yeah, sense. That's right. He's it, very clear on that. Yeah. So it's, it's the most powerful action of response to violence by committing to non-violent uh, ways in, in that sense, yeah. uh, defend your humanity and your dignity. Now, though you are a scientist, but you have spent, uh, I think, a lot of your life uh, empowering Palestinian children uh, with a new form of non-violent resistance, 
uh, by and we are seeing i think some of the work that you are doing playing in the film behind you so how did this begin how did you get drawn to taking these values and ideas to children and then finding ways to work with them on it yeah i guess uh, as a child i was more interested i was very shy so most of my interest was in writing and painting and little by little with the other young people uh, we were going in the fields and like uh, make a team for a play and just improvise. You do this, you do this, and this is the, the story. And later on, I was on the board of uh, Ida Camp Youth Center. Uh, and uh, so I was kind of the responsible for cultural arts committee. And we started, we continued based on improvisation or somebody write something, but includes a lot of improvisation within the performance that we were doing. And as I, my, I love biology as well. So as a painter, as a writer and kind of amateur theater uh, person, that was one part, but I loved biology as well and uh, wanted to be a great uh, researcher and so on. So I did my bachelor degree in Bethlehem University uh, in biology, minor chemistry, and I started learning French and this is where I was chosen among three other students uh, uh, to, to go for a scholarship in France. It wasn't my dream. It was just <laughs> my pure luck. And at that time, uh, I'm talking about 1984. Uh, so we were still under Israeli full military occupation. And it took me one year to get the permit, which was rejected six times, in fact. And so I arrived in France uh, in 1985, uh, and uh, I started working with my biology degree, uh, but also uh, trying to develop my artistic capacity as a painter, as a photographer, and within theater. There was uh, last, uh, theater training in the university, Paris Nord uh, University uh, in the region of Paris. And so this is where I started more professionally, let's say, uh, following the classes, trained in the classical theater, uh, Jean Racine, uh, Shakespeare, even in French, and, and, and so many other. Uh, and in 1988, uh, I co-founded with four others uh, Paris Nord Theater. So it was Paris Nord Theater. Uh, we were a core of five writers, and then there was a professional director with us. And so the idea of writing our own plays and uh, performing them. I saw the impact of theater on, on my life uh, on one side, but also in the connection with the audience. So as I finished my PhD in 1993, returning back to Palestine in 1994, thinking that Palestine was only waiting for me to save it, <laughs> I started working with my biology degree to earn my living, but also volunteering at the university and the schools in the camp to train theater and painting. Until 1998, where with a group of friends, I founded Arwad. Arwad means the pioneers in Arabic, and we started with this philosophy that I call beautiful resistance. Because on one side, I believe every act of resistance against injustice, oppression, occupation, dictatorship, is a beautiful act of a humanity because you reject any kind of injustice. And resisting through culture, arts, education are great acts of resistance because the aim essentially was how to save lives, how to inspire hope, how to give our children and young people possibilities to express themselves in the most beautiful, creative, and non-armed ways. And hopefully they will think living for their country rather than die for their country or whatever cause they are defending. Because at the end of the day, no parents in the world want to live the day where they bury their children. We owe our children life, hope, uh, possibilities where they can grow up and change the world and create miracles and be proud of what they achieve and we can be proud of the heritage we leave for them. So that's why I started with theater uh, because I believe theater is one of the most amazing, powerful, truthful way to express yourself. Shout as loud as you want. And hopefully this will be a way to build peace within yourself. Yeah. Because if you are not in peace with yourself, how can you make peace with anybody? Absolutely. 
and that's what makes me wonder that uh, do you sometimes find that the children you're working with resist what you're saying because their own experiences on the ground uh, I know are sometimes so uh, traumatic that uh, how do you draw them into from out of those traumatic situations how do you, uh, in a sense, convince them about the beautiful resistance? Well, I don't think there is a need to convince in that sense because people are open. And uh, I think the, the challenge was the usefulness of this or not because Israeli wow. language is only with oppression and even nonviolent demonstrations end with tear gas and bullets and so on because there is no other language that the occupier or oppressor knows uh, how to deal with even nonviolent actions. Uh, the essence of it is that listening is an important way to draw people. Because a lot of time, I think children and young people feel not listened to and dictated what they should do rather than discuss with them what they really need and so on. And that's why we started with theater, but as not everybody wants to do theater, we added dance, singing, music, photography, video, supportive education program for children who have a trauma or learning difficulties, working with kindergartens, with the schools, with parents, focus on, on mothers and women, because I believe it's women who change the world much more than the men. So it was important to give these possibilities and not dictate a code of behavior. I'm not here to tell children, don't go to throw stones, don't do this, don't do that. But if Rajni send them to, 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 uh, to throw stones, my fight will be with Rajni. If she wants to go and throw stones, she should do that, but not send, send children to do that. So there is the protection side, and there is the possibility to do what you want. Tell me how I, I can help you. It is challenging when you have eight or 10 years old children, when you ask them about their hope, and dreams, of course, there is those who want to be doctors, engineers, lawyers, pilots, teachers, whatever. But there are those who will say, I want to die. And when a child who is eight or 10 years old tell you, I want to die, why do you want to die? Because nobody cares. Because when the Israeli soldiers come in the middle of the night, there is nobody to protect us. Because the Palestinian authority do not have any real authority to protect even its own citizens. This is a permitted land where the Israeli soldiers can come, do whatever they want, and leave. So that's why the challenge is how to inspire hope for a child like this to think living rather than dying, that we do care, that even if we are not there 24 hours, hour, uh, 24 hours a day to protect them, we care about them, and we want their story to be told, and we want them to have this peace within themselves to be peace builders in their community and in the world. And the arts are this amazing tool, I think, to give that a space. Because when you see a theater play or a film, when you listen to music, when you look at a painting or a photo or whatever, I don't think anybody will say, I will not like it because it's a French or American or Indian or Palestinian. You like, you don't like based on how much it touches you. So this is where stereotypes disappear. And these are the bridges, hopefully, that we can build together to shape this better future for our children, your children, and the generations to come. Yeah. So this is the essence of it. Uh, I know that there are people on both sides uh, who dream of a, a, a region in which violence will stop, where uh, at least uh, uh, if nonviolence is too lofty a goal, and, and I think we are agreed that nonviolence is not the absence of violence but of yeah. true justice. Yeah. Uh, even if, if, is that too lofty a goal? Is one question really. That is it something that you think uh, together, people on both sides of the, of the conflict can someday achieve? Because I know that the effort is there on both sides, but uh, the world looking from outside often thinks, oh, what good is this going to do? It will never work. What is your feeling? Well, I think there is on, uh, on, on, on this equation, not equal two sides. There is the oppressor with all the power, so more than 99% of this population are armed. 
and there is the oppressed who are almost 99% on this side who are non-armed. Uh, there are amazing Israelis who work for peace probably more than a, a lot of other people. But it's important that to, in order to make peace, you should have peace within you to be peace builder, to start with in your community and hope later on in the world. Yeah. If you lack peace, uh, it's impossible to build peace. If there is no justice, yeah. there will never be peace. So in order to build peace, you should build justice and equality for the people who we are talking about. These amazing Israelis should start on their side as I am trying to work on my side to build this peace within our young people and children and so on. Uh, so there is 20% of the Israeli population who are not Jewish and who are Palestinian descendants and who do not have equal rights. Even among the Jewish population itself, black or African Jews are not equal to the white Jews or uh, Arab Jews have not equal uh, equality as well. So there is different categorization within this system of apartheid, even uh, among Jews themselves to start with, with the leaders who want to uh, categorize the population according to, uh, not only to their religion, but also to their ethnicity and where they come from. Yeah. So for me, these amazing Israelis should start by putting equal grounds for their own population to start with, to build their own peace within themselves. And also work for justice. There is uh, illegal or apartheid laws that are there. They should stop. There is this illegal wall of expansion and annexation. It should be removed. There is Ill these illegal colonies that continue to expand and, and so on. Once we are on equal grounds, amazing solutions could happen. Yeah. But putting Israelis and Palestinians together and say we have built peace among people, it will not work because all the foundation is injustice and apartheid uh, system. It's not a, a problem between individuals. It's a problem. It's a problem on political level, and there is the political level which should be solved as yeah. well to make yeah. justice. Yeah, which some people would call structural violence. That yeah. this is due to the the. So how do you deal with it as a person? Because uh, for you dealing with such a gigantic challenge and keeping your own inner peace in place. Uh, is it sometimes a challenge? It's always a challenge. It's always a challenge because the, the the volume of injustice and oppression is beyond any imagination. And everything in your life is under control by the oppressor in that sense. Who can import, who can export, who can manufacture what, who can even fall in love with whoever we want, who can leave the country, who can come back in the country, family reunions, and, and, and so on. All of this under the mercy of the approval or non-approval of the occupier, uh, and, and so on. So, of course, we are human beings, and people, as I said, have different reactions to, to injustice and oppression. And non-violence or non-armed struggle is an intensive effort to keep your integrity as a human being and your humanity in that sense and not to think that the only way is to carry a gun and go and explode yourself and so on. It is a huge challenge under such oppressive system that continues since 75 years until now. It's uh, it's never easy and uh, we don't have a magical wand to make the change. So you need a, a com huge commitment, passion uh, and patience and uh, in order to also inspire the young people and so on. A lot of people, when they come to Palestine, say, you know, it's very complicated. It's hopeless. I say we don't have this luxury of despair. This is not a heritage that we can leave to our children and your children and the generations to come. We are committed to bring hope. We are committed with a steadfast hope that every day that comes should be more beautiful than the day that goes. And instead of just sitting down and complaining that everything is bad and it's always the fault of someone else, we 
identify with over oppressed in the world. And we don't consider ourselves as the only victims in this world because there is a lot of victims in this world. So that's why we cannot monopolize the suffering like some others and say we are the only people who, who suffer and no other suffering count. Every suffering count. If it is one individual or 20 million who suffer, every suffering counts and every injustice should be accounted for. Every yes. oppressor should be accountable for his oppression. That actually brings me to the question that I thought we could wrap up with, that the term beautiful resistance, I think, will have a resonance for people across the world. And uh, I meet many people here, young people here in India, who are uh, in situations of conflict, trying to find ways to address the conflict, move it towards justice, but do it with compassion and nonviolence. So what advice do you have to those young for those young people? I mean, now these are young people in far flung corners of the world who won't have the op opportunity to attend your workshops. But what advice would you give to such people? Well, I can come and do workshops. <laughs> no that of course, that would be lovely. <laughs> I'm but I, I guess it's important to be truthful to who you are and what you are. It's important that the adults surrounding them give that a space of listening and uh, give a space of expression. I am not dictating any child, this is the way to do it. I give you space to do whatever you want. You can choose to paint or to, to make a poem or to write or to mime or to shout or to sing or to dance or it's your creative work to expose your anger and the frustration and, 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 and feelings and what you want to, to get out of it. So that is an, an important way. The second thing is that what world are we building for tomorrow? What country we want to see tomorrow that we are living in? Is it a language where everybody kills everybody? Is it a culture of hatred and diabolization? And uh, uh, if people are consumed with hatred, they lose their humanity. And we are have hearts full of love uh, uh, and, and hope. So we cannot destroy this love and hope with hatred and, and violence. So it's important that people who are waiting for change to happen it will not happen by itself. No. Gandhi said, be the change you want to see. And people are important. And that's why everybody is important and everybody is a change maker. And if people are waiting for miracles to happen, they will not happen. We need to provoke them to happen. And that's why we are equal partners to shape this better future. And that's why every child is important and should be listened to. And every adult don't think that they know better because a lot of time the creativity and imagination of children surprise us beyond our own imaginations and, and, and so on. The second thing I guess is uh, as a change maker, you draw the line where you want to go and where you, you want your community or your country to go. So if you choose a path the easiest would, would be going towards violence and towards hatred and so on. This is an easy path because blaming the others about your problems and so on is the easiest way to say it's not my fault, it's the fault of the others. But think and be uh, uh, grateful to the chance that you have to be able to think and see a better future for yourself and for those who you will serve in your community be an inspiration to positive and not to negative, dark, <laughs> bad, and so on. This is not easy. It yeah. needs commit. It's need, it needs patience. Yeah. But who said that beautiful things are easy to get? So that's, that's why right. we need and to And above work. all, I think it, it means that you have to let go of your bitterness. Yes. Yeah. Of course you have. Anything else that you would like to add before we conclude? 
Well, as as you said, I I believe that beautiful resistance concerns everybody, not only Palestinians. That we should celebrate similarities as well as differences as something that should enrich us and not marginalize us and make us afraid from each other. That we should identify with over breast like we identify with ourselves and we should make every oppressor accountable for what they are and not specifically by going and explode everything but uh, you know our prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said support your brother whether he is oppressed or oppressor so his companions were puzzled with this i mean yes we can understand that you support an oppressed but how you support an oppressor he said by preventing him from doing the oppression. So if you have a friend who you care about uh, and you want, and he is a drug addict or alcoholic, what do you do? Give more drugs, more alcohol, or deprive them from drugs and alcohol to, to save them and cure them? It's important to make our friends, even if they are oppressed, accountable and know that they cannot go and continue their oppression because it will destroy them at the end of the day. And I'll finish by this. The world will not change by good intentions or good words. It needs good actions. And that's why where every single one of us is important to make good actions and not just the beautiful words and intentions. Thank you so much. One second. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate the work you're doing and all the best, very best to you. Thank you. And looking forward to welcome you here.